friends, welcome back to our Christian Women series. I am your host, Kathy Jo Hart. I am a Christian speaker and author of God's Chosen Helper. Our focus is to discuss the hot topics of the day and how it relates to the Bible and the lessons through the love of Christ. Our last episode, we learned about the story of Deborah, who was a judge, a military warrior, a prophetess, and the leader of the Israeli people found in chapters 4 and 5 in the book of Judges. Although God has used women in leadership roles throughout the Bible, we have also learned that being a warrior does not necessarily mean physical leadership of battle. It can be spiritual, physical, mental, or emotional. God has provided women with profound abilities to overcome insurmountable adversities, hardships, tragedies, and even fear. And this brings us to our episode today, The Story of Esther. I admit, I have watched a couple of movies about Esther, so I thought I knew the story fairly well. But movies don't tell the full story. So when I began studying the book of Esther, the best parts of the story were hidden in the details. But first, we need to take a look at the historical context of the book of Esther. After Jerusalem fell to King Nebuchadnezzar, most of the Jewish people were exiled in Babylon. As we learned in Isaiah, God chose Cyrus the Great, the ruler of the Persian Empire, to free the Jews from captivity and help them return to their homelands. Some of the Jewish people returned to Judah, while others decided to stay in the provinces of Persia. The key here was the Jewish people were free. When King Xerxes inherited the throne, he also inherited great wealth. In chapter 1 of Esther, we see the king hosting a massive six-month-long celebration in his honor, displaying the glorious wealth of his kingdom and the magnificent splendor of his greatness. Sounds like a humble guy, right? At the end of six months, the king held a week-long banquet in the courtyard of the royal palace garden, and during this time, his wife, Queen Vashti, entertained the women of the palace with food and wine. Now, can you imagine what it would have been like to have a continual six-month party with people gorging themselves on food and wine? Even the king's royal decree was everyone had to drink wine. I mean, everyone was drunk and probably smelled pretty bad by the end of the party. And then on the seventh day of the banquet, this would have been on day 187 of partying, King Xerxes, who was probably pretty drunk at that time too, decided he wanted to show off his wife's beauty. She was to wear her royal crown and was expected to entertain his guests. And we can only imagine what type of entertainment he requested, as some biblical scholars believe King Xerxes wanted Queen Vashti to wear nothing but her royal crown, if you know what I mean. From what we can gather from Scripture, Queen Vashti was not having it. She was not in the mood, and she was probably exhausted and hung over herself, you know, and she told the servants no. And Queen Vashti's refusal made the king furious. I mean, he was livid. He consulted with his legal experts on what to do with the queen, because no one, not even the queen, could refuse the king's command. Here we have a drunk king with his drunk legal experts making a life-or-death decision on punishing the queen. But it wasn't just about what to do with the queen. 
the legal experts were panicked with the queen saying no to her husband and that it would influence all women to say no to their husbands. And the punishment had to be severe. And severe it was. A royal decree was issued, and Queen Vashti lost her position as queen and was banished. Some biblical scholars believe she was actually executed. But there was more. The edict read that all men would be the master of his own home and that all women were to be in full submission to their husbands. And this decree could not be revoked either. This was permanent. In one fell swoop, women instantly became oppressed. I guess this was their way of preventing potential marital problems. But this sets the stage for Esther. The king began his quest to find a new queen. The parameters for a new queen? She had to be a virgin with physical beauty. A committee was established to gather all of the beautiful young virgins to the harem at the palace. Now, royal harems meant sexual servitude for the nobles. Now, I can imagine when the committees went out to the different provinces, those who were selected most likely did not go voluntarily. Esther was one of many who were gathered. And once they arrived at the palace, each young girl went through one year of beauty treatments and preparations, and these young girls were assigned their own servants. Now, Esther was described as having a beautiful figure and was very good-looking. But Esther was different than the other girls, as she was a Jew. Esther was orphaned as a young girl and was raised by her cousin Mordecai. He became her guardian. And because of their Jewish heritage, Mordecai ordered Esther to keep their family background a secret. What also made Esther different than the other girls was her personality. Esther had a gentle and humble spirit and was not materialistic nor was she demanding. The king's eunuch had a fondness for Esther, and he gave her special attention. He gave her a special diet and the best living quarters. Eunuchs were male servants who were castrated in order to serve the king, queen, and harem. And eunuchs typically were trusted by the royal court and had great influence. As scripture reads, Esther gained favor in the eyes of everyone who saw her. But make no mistake, gaining the attention of King Xerxes was not a glamorous role. Meeting the king meant an overnight sleepover with the king. And this went completely against Jewish tradition, as sex was to be between a husband and wife, and Jewish women were not to marry outside of their race. The eunuch who watched over the harem took a liking to Esther and gave her an inside track on how to win the king's favor. And Esther did exactly as the eunuch said. And with the help of the eunuch, she won the king's favor and was selected to become queen. When Esther was taken by the royal committee, Mordecai moved to be near her. He was very concerned about her well-being and hung out at the king's gate, just hoping to catch a glimpse of his daughter. He became a common fixture there as he waited for any opportunity to see her. After Esther became queen, Mordecai was in his usual position at the king's gate when he overheard two eunuchs plotting to assassinate the king. Upon learning of their plans, Mordecai sent a message to Queen Esther 
and she then informed the king of the assassination plot. And when the plot was confirmed, the two eunuchs were hung on the gallows. The event was then recorded in the official historical record, and this recording will become an important part of Esther's story, as Mordecai received credit in the record as the hero who saved the king. But note, the king did not immediately reward Mordecai for his heroism. Most heroes would have been given an immediate place of honor in the king's court, but God's delayed timing was an important part of his plan. Up to this moment, everything about the story went against God's character. And you begin to wonder, where was God in all of this? I'm pretty sure many of us have asked God, where were you? Why did you allow this to happen? And I'm fairly certain Esther and Mordecai were asking the same questions too. Because instead of Mordecai receiving a place of honor in the king's court, we are introduced to the king's new right-hand man, and his name was Haman. And here's the backstory of Haman. Haman was a descendant of Agag, the leader of the Amalekites. The Amalekites were evil and were an enemy of the Jewish people. They were described as shape-shifting sorcerers who were able to transform into animals to avoid capture. And we would need to go back to the time of Moses and Exodus, and then again in 1 Samuel, to see the lineage of wars between the Amalekites and the Jews. Haman was a descendant of King Agag, and Mordecai was a descendant of King Saul, the first king of Israel. The significance of this was King Saul's failure to keep God's command to attack the Amalekites and completely destroy everything they had. And this included all men, women, and children, their fortune, and livestock. And God said in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 3, Do not spare them. This was God's judgment on evil. But King Saul did not follow God's command and not only allowed King Agag to survive, but plundered their fortunes and livestock. King Saul lost God's favor and was punished. The kingdom then received a new king named David. When Haman was promoted to the highest position within the king's court, his hatred for the Jewish people escalated. Haman's new position required everyone to bow down to him, but Mordecai refused, and this infuriated Haman. As Haman's rage grew, so did his plan to not only execute Mordecai, but he wanted to destroy all of the Jews in the Persian Empire. Haman convinced King Xerxes that the Jewish people were not obeying the king's laws. And as a result of their alleged disobedience, the king put Haman in charge to do whatever he wanted to do with the Jewish people by saying, the money and people are given to you to do with as you see fit. And Haman, with his unlimited authority, wrote the royal decree ordering the officials in all of the provinces to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jewish people, young and old, women and children, and plunder their possessions on a single day, the 13th day of Adar in the 12th month. And this caused a great deal of confusion since a royal decree could not be changed, not even by the king himself. What was done was now law, and the Jewish people needed to prepare for their own massacre. There was no stopping the madness that Haman created. And there was great mourning in the city. 
Mordecai put on sackcloth and ashes, which was a symbol of great distress, and stood at the king's gate. Queen Esther's eunuchs and servants reported the news to her, and the queen was overcome by fear. She sent clothes to Mordecai, which he refused. Mordecai then gave Esther's servants a copy of the royal decree ordering their destruction. At first, Esther sent word to Mordecai telling him she could not approach the king without being first summoned by the king. To do so would be instant death. And at that point in their marriage, the king had not summoned the queen for the past 30 days. She believed that she had somehow lost favor with the king, making it nearly impossible for her to do anything. But Mordecai challenged Esther by saying, Don't think that you will escape the fate of all the Jews because you are in the king's palace. If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place, but you and your father's family will be destroyed. And then he said, Who knows? Perhaps you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And this is when we begin seeing God's plan and timing come together. As Esther responded with, Go and assemble all the Jews who can be found in Susa and fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my female servants will also fast in the same way. After that, I will go to the king, even if it is against the law. And this is when we also begin seeing the true power of fasting and prayer. On the third day, Queen Esther dressed in her finest royal clothes and stood in the royal courtyard hoping the king would notice her, and her plan worked. The king noticed her, and she regained favor with him. This step of faith was incredibly brave as she risked instant death and just being seen by the king without being summoned. You know, Queen Esther must have used every beauty treatment, perfume, and chose the perfect outfit that made her appear as though she was the most beautiful woman ever seen. And I'm sure God's favor was also used on the king to create that necessary spark that made Esther the most desirable woman as the king responded with, What is it, Queen Esther? Whatever you want, even to half the kingdom, will be given to you. Her plan was to hold a banquet for the king and Haman. The success of that banquet led to another one in their honor, but this time Haman believed that he had won favor with both the king and queen. As he gleefully strolled past the king's gate, he again saw Mordecai standing firm in his refusal to bow down to him, and this enraged Haman even more. It wasn't enough that he had ordered the destruction of the Jewish people. Oh no, he needed an immediate satisfaction of revenge. And that night, Haman constructed a 75-foot-tall gallows to hang Mordecai the next day. But that same evening... The king could not sleep, so he ordered the reading of the historical record to lull him to sleep. But instead, the story of the hero Mordecai was read to the king, and the king inquired, What honor and special recognition have been given to Mordecai for this act? And the king's attendant answered him with, Nothing has been done for him. As if on cue, Haman entered the royal courtyard to request permission to hang Mordecai on the gallows he had prepared for him. 
The king, however, spoke first, and he said to Haman, What should be done for the man the king wants to honor? Notice the king did not say who he wanted to honor. Talk about God's perfect timing. Haman had no idea who the king wanted to honor. Haman's arrogance believed that the king wanted to honor him. So Haman responded with, For the man the king wants to honor, have them bring a royal garment that the king himself has worn, and a horse the king himself has ridden, which has a royal crown on its head. Put the garment and the horse under the charge of one of the king's most noble officials. Have them clothe the man the king wants to honor. Parade him on the horse through the city square and call out before him. This is what is done for the man the king wants to honor. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine the look on Haman's face when the king replied, Hurry and do just as you proposed. Take a garment and a horse for Mordecai the Jew who was sitting at the king's gate. Do not leave out anything you have suggested. Haman had no other choice than to do what the king commanded. As the royal parade ended, Haman returned to his home and he was distraught. And to make matters worse, Haman's wife spoke to him about his potential downfall. And as he was being berated, the queen's eunuch arrived at his home to escort him to the banquet. And so far, we know Haman was not having a good day. And little did he know, it was about to get a lot worse because it was at this banquet Queen Esther asked the king to spare her life and the life of her people. The king seemed stunned at the thought of anyone threatening her life and the life of her people and demanded to know who devised such a scheme. And Queen Esther answered, The adversary and enemy is this evil Haman. The king was instantly grieved and angry, and Haman stood terrified. As the king walked a few steps away from Queen Esther, Haman made the mistake of lunging after Esther to beg for his life. But from the king's perspective, Haman's desperate lunge was interpreted as Haman violating the queen. And before Haman could say or do anything, the king's attendants quickly subdued him. And the eunuch who brought Haman to the banquet, he told the king about the gallows Haman had built to hang Mordecai. The king then ordered Haman to be hanged on the very gallows he had built for Mordecai. That same day, the king awarded Queen Esther the estate of Haman. And this is when Queen Esther revealed to the king her relationship to Mordecai. The king, in return, gave Mordecai his signet ring, which provided Mordecai with the highest honor in the king's court. Mordecai was now second in command. Although this ended the life and rule of Haman, it did not change the royal decree of destroying the Jewish people. So another decree was written by Mordecai that gave the Jews permission to defend themselves, to fight, destroy, and kill anyone who would be hostile to the Jews. Whomever tried to annihilate the Jews would suffer the same consequence of destruction. This counter-royal decree saved the Jewish people. The law went into effect on the 13th day of the 12th month of Adar. 
Those who wished to do harm to the Jewish people were considered the enemy and were killed. Included in those killed in the city of Susa was Haman's ten sons. Queen Esther requested that the ten dead bodies of Haman's sons be hung on the very gallows that hung their father. This was a display to further warn the public. As word spread of Mordecai's decree, the enemies of the Jewish people fought against them. Over 75,000 of their enemies were killed throughout the provinces. But the victory of the Jewish people was eminent, and Mordecai became a good and powerful leader. To ensure every generation would not lose their significance in Jewish life, Mordecai established the Jewish holiday of Purim to celebrate the survival of the Jews from the evil Haman. In the year 2024, the fast of Esther is on March 21st, and from sunup to sundown, participants are required to fast. The festival of Purim will begin at sundown on Saturday, March 23rd, and end at nightfall on Sunday, March 24th. The celebrations include extravagant costumes, reading the Book of Esther, giving charity to the poor, exchanging gift baskets of food, and a feast. It is also believed that Jesus celebrated the Feast of Purim as well. Now, the one question I had when I read through the Book of Esther is if Christians should celebrate Purim too. And I believe the answer is yes, because of the promise God made to Abraham. As stated in Genesis chapter 12, the Lord said to Abram, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. The story of Esther is also a reminder that the spirit of Haman still exists, and we are in the throes of battle between good and evil that requires God's supernatural deliverance. And we cannot afford to sit back and do nothing as the enemy continues to use fear to intimidate us into silence. It is more important now than ever that we do not lose sight of our purpose to further God's kingdom. And as Mordecai said to Esther, and I say to you now, we were made for such a time as this. And as we end our podcast, I encourage you to like and share our Christian Women's series with your friends and family. Click the follow button below so you won't miss our next episode in our Christian Women's series. And thank you so much for joining me today. And remember, God loves you and he is for you. Have a blessed week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.